Hey folks, something a little different today. I'm going to read to you from my book, Working for the Man, Playing in the Band, My Years with James Brown, also written with Phil Carson. We're going to read a little chapter here. It has some great quotes from the band members. Magic hand signals. The dynamics of a James Brown show would have been impossible without cues. From experience, we knew the emotional and musical arc of the show and that a number of songs could fit each segment. But which ones? Also, a James Brown show rarely let up, so he had developed segues and embellishments for any occasion which could buy him a moment to decide where to go next. Every performance was fluid and in the moment. He could create a medley of his songs on the spot in real time and call the arrangement on the fly because he had trained the band to watch him so closely. He could go into any song at any time or segue from one song to another after just one verse. He felt he had to keep the show moving at maximum excitement and should a lull in energy seem imminent, he could punch up the show with the wave of his hand. His presentation aimed to hold the audience's complete attention, whether that meant breaking out a dance step, bringing on the dancers, pointing someone in for a solo, or turning to the bittersweet for a song. He used everybody on stage and every one of their talents to keep the show moving. Yet James Brown could also use a soulful ballad to touch the audience's deeper emotions and use that connection to keep them utterly engaged. The simplicity of a ballad captivated the listener, and he knew how to exploit that moment by releasing all the energy he'd built up with his high-energy funk. Ballads had emotional peaks too, like in Please, 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 when he and Danny Ray would do the cape routine. It's all about the show. We even had Wimbush, the magician, at one point. We'd break into Grover Washington's Mr. Magic and Wimbush would take the stage with a couple of tricks. I kid you not. For cues to work, of course, we had to see them and understand them. That meant everyone on stage focused on him at all times. I'd have to keep track of what the drummer and bass player were doing with one eye and keep the other trained on Mr. Brown. That could be nerve wracking. Here's a quote from Robert Mousy Thompson, fantastic drummer of James Brown. The whole key to James Brown was watching him because a lot of times he didn't know where he wanted to go. But when he went there, he knew you were with him. He'd be like, my man, you've got his back. He wanted his whole band like that. If you took your eyes off him and he caught you, you were in trouble. Sometimes I think he would purposefully do things to push you off your game. We called him Games Brown. Working with Wilson Pickett, I joined his band in 1983 and played off and on with him until I joined James Brown in 1993. It was soulful and you'd just play with him. But Brown was a conductor, an innovator. You played for him. You had to watch him. One minute he's doing his thing, the next minute he might be doing something else. Here's a quote from Eric Hargrove, another fantastic drummer from James Brown. To play with James Brown in that band, you locked in with him. Once you started playing, sure, you were listening to the rest of the band and you were laying down what you thought should be played or what he dictated that you play. And then you waited for his approval. You were waiting for a signal that what you were playing was correct. Your focus was on him for at least the first 30 seconds. And then you could really listen to what was around you and make sure everyone was locking into you. If the music wasn't happening, was it okay to maybe shift your timing? If you did, you took a risk. He hasn't said anything yet, that the groove is wrong, that the timing is wrong, so you'd risk changing it to what you think it should be, and he might point you out and have the other drummer play. He'd make changes like that minute to minute. If he didn't hear what he wanted to hear, maybe you weren't playing what he wanted, maybe it wasn't coming through the monitors right, maybe he wanted the sound to come from his other ear because one drum set was on his left, the other was on his right. I was always on his right. A number of factors played into why he might switch us. He'd do that with the guitar players too. He'd tell one to lay out. Same thing with the bass players. Trying to guess the reasons could be very frustrating. So in certain gigs where he was really tense, you just played until you saw that he was comfortable with what you were playing and then you could really listen to what was happening on stage. Other gigs where he was looser about it, you can listen to whichever bass player was playing or whichever guitar rhythm was happening and usually everyone was already locked in. But you could play off of it too if he was in a playful mood. And he would like that and acknowledge that what you were doing was good. So that was the end of the Eric Hargrove quote. Here we continue with the book. No matter how much knowledge, experience, and ESP you thought you had, Mr. Brown could surprise you. He could come up in the middle of a show and give you a very specific direction using signals you'd never seen and you'd have to, quote, cipher it. During one of the last shows I played, he came to me and gave me a brand new rhythm part for Sex Machine, a part I'd never played before. He walked over to me on stage, got really close, and said, Ah, uh, don't play that. Try something like this. And he sang a new rhythm part into my ear. I had to use everything I'd learned to translate his vocalized phrases into notes and intervals in the right scale to make it happen instantly. You'd think furiously fast. Does his rhythm start on the one or the upbeat after the one? You'd have to guess and you might be wrong. He'd shake his head no and sing it to you again. You'd offer a different set of notes. 
this is live on stage in front of however many thousand people. But the more you did that with him, the more you had an idea of where he wanted to go. And he loved it when you got it instantly. He led that band like a conductor leads an orchestra, but with no charts, just hand signals. At other times, of course, there was a little ambiguity. He'd just point you in for a solo. At that moment, he was essentially entrusting his show to you, handing you the energy and expecting you to take it higher. So there'd be pressure when he turned to you. As a guitar player, I'd be playing rhythm on all these tight grooves, punctuating them with little riffs. Suddenly, Mr. Brown would whirl around and point me in. The message, improvise now, over one chord for two minutes and make it interesting. That's not always easy. In line with his taste for theatrics, James Brown generally liked to have his soloist peak on a climactic high note. He'd point to the ceiling, heh heh heh, take it up man, and I'd start to build to a climax, one eye on greatness, the other on Mr. Brown. At that moment, he's anticipating his next move. He's poised to take the song back from you and lead the energy back into the show. He'd give you a verse for your solo, then the nod to wrap it up, even if you might not be in that place in a phrase where you're able and ready to reach the peak. So he might extend his cue to you by jumping up and down a bit, telling you to get there quicker. He knows you're not quite ready, but you'd better be heading to your climax soon, his body language saying, because it's time for me to move on. He never cut you off, though. It was never, I want it back right now. He was always musical and savvy about how to time it, but he'd give you the idea, okay, get after it now. Yet you knew you had time to do it gracefully. Here's a quote from Willie Ray Bo Brundage, one of the great bass players of James Brown. Everything was based on signals. When he called up a song, you had to know the signal. You had to listen and be alert. A new song could begin on the next beat. Whatever song it was, you might play on the intro, and then whoever's song it was would take it from there. Sometimes, for whatever reason, if you were out of tune, Mr. Brown would cut you off and have the other guy play your song. It all depended on what Mr. Brown was feeling. I used to get tested a lot. It's almost like football, where the quarterback throws you a pass to see if you can catch it. Now, if you catch it, he might take it right back, or he might throw it to you again. So he'd point me in and out, and Fred Thomas, the other bass player, in and out, all within the same song. You had to be watching him. He could point you in for four measures, cut you out, put Fred in, cut him off, and put you back in all before the bridge. Just to check the balance of the sound, the balance of the groove. He watched all that stuff. For me, it was the ultimate training. We called it James Brown University. You had to learn the show from his point of view. It's not correct until he approves it. Here's another one from Eric Hargrove. One signal was a segue signal to move from one song to another. He would touch the top of his head. He wouldn't actually touch his head. His hand would just go up towards his face. But because he moved his arms a particular way, you knew by watching his body language that he was about to do it or something was about to happen. Constant variables were always happening. There were times when he'd turn really quickly and give that signal and you'd have to catch it. There were times when he was more slow and deliberate about it and you knew it was coming, no doubt about it. You learned these signals by watching, show after show. You didn't get a class on this, a brief or anything on which signal meant and what you did when you got the signal. You saw it happen, then you knew, oh, that's what that is. My whole first year I was still learning the signals and new ones came up all the time. I'd be like, whoa, what is that? When you saw him start to turn towards you, your heart started pounding. You're wondering, is this good? Is this bad? Is he going to point me out? What's going on? Then he'd turn and it'd either be a smile or a frown. You really hoped that it was a smile. Sometimes it was just him. Sometimes he just didn't feel it, no matter how great the band was playing. He might start switching instruments. He might cut one song and go to a different song after only 10 seconds. If a song didn't take off, he'd give that segue signal to move on. And here's one by Holly Ferris, the great trumpeter. He was definitely a showman. That's what he was about. He couldn't stand up there and dance all night, so he'd come up with other stuff, change up his songs. We hated that because he didn't realize that people wanted to hear his songs the way he originally did them. So we'd kind of resist that, but he'd still put changes into his music, sometimes for the better, sometimes not. Most of that took place on stage. We kind of knew what he wanted, but he'd signal and we'd just follow along. You had to always pay attention because you never knew what was going to happen. He had to feel it. Sometimes he'd get flat out bored doing the same songs for 40 years. He'd get bored with it and he'd try to change it up a bit. Most of the time he was making changes to get that feeling. 